Hello today. How are we doing? Good, I hope. All right. So from our last uh, presentation, we were talking about covalent bonding and uh, creating Lewis structures. Um, and the Lewis structures we created in the last uh, video were just the standard ones, the ones that um, obey the octet rule and, you know, just acted like normal good elements should. And uh, now we're going to talk about the troubled children. Um, so exceptions to the octet rule, as well as something called resonance, which um, are all things that you should have seen in general chemistry. So here we go. All right, so when we talk about exceptions to the octet rule, um, it's first and foremost important to remember that what we did previously to this um, is pretty much the, the norm. Um, some don't follow it, but most atoms actually do follow the octet rule. Um, this is a great example, um, PF5, which would be uh, phosphorus penta fluoride. Um, you can see here in the picture that we have um, phosphorus in the middle and then five uh, fluorine, fluoride, um, I'm sorry, fluorine atoms uh, all around it. And so obviously if you have five attachments to something, uh, you have exceeded the octet rule. So um, what we end up with with uh, phosphorus is actually something called a pseudo noble gas configuration um, because it is a relatively stable configuration for phosphorus, yet again it exceeds the octet rule. Um, so when we talk about the octet rule, it's kind of important to recognize, um, again, why it's eight. Um, we assume that we are filling whatever energy level it is. So again, the N just stands for an energy level. Um, that whatever energy level it is, you will fill the S, and then you also fill uh, the P. Excuse me, I need to cough. <clears throat> All right, good. Um, so two uh, electrons for the S and six for the P is going to equal eight. Well, all the elements, notice the word all in capitals and italics, um, in the first two periods will follow this. So everything from hydrogen through neon we know will never ever exceed the octet. But as you go into the third period, you may notice that phosphorus is a member of the third period. That's when uh, funky things start happening. Um, because what they actually do when you move into the third period, that's actually the third energy level. And the third energy level does include the D block, um, even though it's uh, you know, a little bit further out energy level three has a D uh, subshell. And so we can use that for bonding too. And that's actually what happens when they exceed the octet rule is that they use this um, extra space in um, this D subshell. And then that can fill with electrons. Um, so again, when that's the case, they can exceed the octet. Um, PF3, as I have in parentheses down there, is also a perfectly acceptable um, normal type of thing that could happen. Um, Again, you're sort of looking more at charges, uh, P with a negative 3, F with a, I'm sorry, P with, um, PF3, I'm sorry, is not ionic, um, but that's also something that's possible, and it actually would not exceed the octet rule at that point. So, again, there's just some atoms in here that have options, and uh, one of their options is sometimes exceeding the octet. So, if you would take a look um, at, oh, I'm sorry, I was on the wrong slide. Um, so, again, Continuing with exceptions to the octet rule, um, on the other hand, some elements are happy to have less than an octet. Um, so on the previous slide, we're talking about more than an octet, and now how about less? So this tends to happen only with certain elements, and those are going to be in groups 2a and 3a. And it always happens with an, um, an element that is going to be very, very, very electronegative. And the reason for that is because these very electronegative elements, all they want is electrons. And these 2a and 3a elements, um, they tend to form positive ions. They have lower ionization energies. So they're, they're sort of willing to give away the electrons. And again, these high electronegative elements are willing to take them. So it's kind of this, um, this uh, perfect combination, a perfect storm, um, in which you have this one element that sort of doesn't care about electrons and another element that really does. And so that will in turn lead to um, actually 
is underseeding a word. Uh, instead of exceed, we underseed. Why not? Um, we go way less than an octet. So in the case of um, boron trifluoride that you see in the picture here, this is a very typical compound. In fact, it's one you might want to actually memorize um, because you will see it quite often. So that's a, a good example of that. Um, so a valence of less than 8 is explained by a large difference in electronegativity values as we just were discussing. Um, additionally, here at the bottom, I kind of explain what I just had mentioned, um, that the uh, quote-unquote strong, um, again, it's electronegativity uh, strong, uh, fluorine pulls on electrons, and the boron is basically just too stinking weak, and it just cannot really compete with that. Um, you might notice the words at the bottom. So electronegative is, is obviously a word we've talked about several times before. But it's kind of important to throw out this word electropositive, which you might um, be able to determine is the exact opposite of being electronegative. So electronegative means you know, you're going to be able to draw electrons towards yourself relatively easily, and electropositive is not. Um, in fact, you're going to give away electrons relatively easily. So boron is very electropositive, fluorine is very electronegative, and again, it's that perfect storm. So now the slide I was thinking about before. Um, if you would take a look in your textbook, page 382, there's a box um, in there that talks about um, when, when octet, you know, sort of works and not. Um, so basically what I would ask at this point is to just pause the video and read what's on this uh, slide or to read it right out of the textbook is fine. Um, and just to have an idea of some of the things that we've really already talked about, but it's just a really good review right now. So go ahead and pause the video as needed. Okay, so continuing on, um, we now have our discussion of octet exceptions, both exceeding and going underneath um, the level of the octet. And now we're going to move to, apparently, look at sample exercises on page 8.7 and 8.8. .8. Um, so, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, take a look at those example exercises. Um, again, I, I ask here, do they make sense? So do me a favor. Um, again, pause the video. Check out these sample exercises. Um, Double check, read carefully if it makes sense. Um, great. If not, please write down your questions and bring them back um, tomorrow. So pause as needed. Okay, so now we'll talk about resonance. Um, finally on the right track. Um, so what I would like for you to do is, again, um, pause the video. Draw the Lewis structure for ozone, O3. Do your absolute best. Pause now. All right, so what I'm curious about is now what did you come up with? Um, if you drew the correct Lewis structure, you might have drawn maybe one of these. Like you might have started right here, right? Um, you might have started right here and you ended up the, or you, you uh, determined that the oxygen here in the middle, or one of these oxygens at least, was not happy. Um, and so what's in the green box is likely one of the two answers that you came up with. And I would ask that you look at what you drew and then just determine, did you draw the one on the left or did you draw the one on the right? Okay, well now that you've determined that, my question for you is, does it matter which one you made? So what do you think the answer to that is? Yes or no? The answer is yes. You need them both. Um, in fact, to have them both is to um, really give the complete description of this, um, of this molecule's bonding. Um, and we'll describe here in just one second. So this is a part where I always feel like it's a little bit um, abstract. So please do let me know um, in class tomorrow if there's issues and you'd like to talk more about um, anything um, regarding resonance or understanding why we need all these structures. So as it says here, in theory, based on Lewis structures, there should be one single and one double bond in the ozone molecule. So um, do you agree with that? You know, Lewis structure is pretty clear. One single, one double. Well, um, we also know that single bonds are actually longer and double bonds are actually shorter. Um, more electrons held between the atoms um, actually will draw atoms closer to each other. So a double bond is a lot shorter than a single bond. Um, and I mention that because if uh, you are a fancy schmancy chemist, um, somewhere in the world, you've actually experimentally determined that uh, the bond length of each of these bonds, so this one here, and this one here, or if we do this one and this one, um, that the bond length actually is not a typical bond length for a single bond. 
and it's actually not a typical bond length for a double bond, which is sort of like, uh, what? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. We're supposed to have a single and a double, but the lengths don't seem to match up. In fact, what they've found is that the bond lengths, both of them, happen to be somewhere in between a single and a double. So if you might imagine that the bond length for a single bond is, uh, um, say, and I'm just going to throw out a random number, okay? So let's say that a single bond, we're just going to give it the, the designation of a 1 for single. So a bond length of, of a single bond is supposed to be 1, and um, the bond length of a double bond, let's just say it's going to be 2, um, which I know the, the numbers may seem a little confusing to you because, again, single bonds are longer, double bonds are shorter, but just kind of go with the, the numerical working there. Um, and so understand that actually what they've determined is that both of these bonds that are in ozone here um, that I've drawn in the Lewis structure, both of those bonds would be, in fact, like a 1.5, both of them. That's not normal. Like, what the heck is going on? So that led them to um, really trying to figure out what the heck was, in fact, going on. So resonance structures, what they're used to do, um, and the reason this is, again, the reason why you need both structures, they're used to describe that this Lewis structure, that this molecule you're actually trying to represent on paper, has delocalized bonding. And you may remember that, um, that fr the phrase, or the, I'm sorry, word delocalized from um, metallic bonding, that you had delocalized electrons. Well, in this case, the bonding is actually delocalized. And what it means is that even though we say there's going to be two electrons here in this single bond and four electrons in this double bond, the, this collection of six electrons that's involved in bonding are actually delocalized. They're, they're sort of constantly moving around. And so in order to correctly represent a Lewis structure for something like ozone, you actually have to show all of the possible structures um, as, as we were saying. So in fact, notice what I have here in the green box that all I've done is put a double-sided arrow in between those two and what that's showing is that those are both um, correct, both possible, and they both exist. Um, another way to write it is like this. So do you notice that um, the change here is I've included this um, sort of dotted line that spans between two bonds and what that dotted line is kind of saying is like hey I really don't know or I'm let me rephrase that. Um, it's what the what the dotted line is saying is, you know, there really isn't a double bond anywhere. It's in fact um, two equivalent bonds of the same bond length. Neither one is a single or a double, but there are extra electrons floating around in there. Um, so all in all, basically what you're doing is you look at the structure, and if you've created a structure, say like this, what you want to do is ask yourself a question. Did I have to put the double bond on the left? And if the answer to that question is no, that I totally and completely could have put the double bond on the right, then that's when you're going to need resonance structures. Um, so this tends to happen with um, ions, like polyatomic ions, um, and this also tends to happen with um, certain elements a lot, like oxygens and sulfurs, nitrogens. Um, those tend to be your typical ones. So to, uh, to do a quick example, um, what I would ask is a question maybe such as this. So you might even notice it doesn't even specifically say, hey, draw a Lewis structure. Um, it says, what is expected to have a shorter sulfur-oxygen bond, SO3 or SO3-2 negative? So we're talking about sulfur trioxide or the sulfite ion. So what that's going to require you to do to determine bond length is to actually draw the Lewis structures for each. So what I would ask you to do at this moment is please pause the video. Please draw the Lewis structures, again thinking about maybe resonance here, and then I will show you the answer in just one second. Pause please. Okay, so um, hopefully you've drawn those Lewis structures, and now for the exciting answer. For SO3, you should have three resonance structures because there really is no rhyme or reason to the choice of putting a double bond in any of the three positions possible. So technically it has to be shown in all three positions with double-sided arrows between. Without double-sided arrows, it's not fully correct. Um, when you do SO3 to negative, when you do the sulfite though, um, again, you have to put the square brackets, you have to put the charge, 
but there's enough electrons to go around here. And so you can completely fill the octets, which lends itself to then just being one single structure and not requiring resonance. So now to answer the actual question, um, when you look at SO3, all of these three bonds are actually equivalent, remember, even though in the picture it shows two singles and a double, um, experimentally it's proven that all of those lengths are actually um, relatively the same. So three bonds, all are shorter than a normal single bond, um, which means that if you look at SO3, well these are just plain old single bonds and there's really nothing fancy going on here at all. So um, the answer to the question, which is expected to have the shorter sulfur oxygen bond length, it would be the sulfur trioxide because of the resonance structures. So again, hopefully all that makes sense. Um, uh, record your questions, bring them back, and we'll talk it all through tomorrow. See you later.